Depending on the size and style of the company, documentarians can be in a perfect meeting point between engineering, product, marketing, support, and most crucially, end users. You have likely heard of user experience, a well-established practice that seeks to put users at the center of product development and ensure that their needs are met when creating and maintaining a project. As developer-focused projects increase in popularity, use and revenue, there has been a growing movement called developer experience, or DX or DevX for short. It's something of a sub-practice of UX and focuses on the unique needs and thinking of developer end users as they create for their own end users. It's an early stage practice, but one where documentarians who are working on projects aimed at developers are in an even more crucial role to help contribute to the best developer experience for their project. Throughout most of 2020, I've been running a live stream called, and this is where the naming gets complicated, Dexpose, DevExpose, Dexpose, anyway, it's a D-X-P-O-S-E. Thanks to those who contributed to that name. But throughout most of 2020, I've been running this live stream where I see how far I can get in about 45 to 60 minutes with a developer-focused project. And thanks to that, I have been slowly building a list of common issues, pitfalls that I encounter, which led me to this talk, and I hope in the future to a series of blog posts and other videos where I can offer people advice on fixing some of these issues and pitfalls. Everything I present here, I have encountered during this live stream, sometimes multiple times. Before we continue, let me introduce myself. I am Chris Ward. I am a technical writer based in Berlin at the moment, but actually I'm half Australian too, so good day to you all. I'm currently a tech writer for a company called Chronosphere, which is a very developer focused tool. And I've spent most of the past five to six years working in similar projects, very developer focused tools. I should also introduce you to one of the most important people in this presentation, my developer friend, who conveniently is also my twin brother. And they've just discovered a fantastic new developer tool that they are very enthusiastic about and are keen to try. It's called example.js, a somewhat arbitrary and convenient developer tool. Over to you. All right, I've heard about this great new developer tool called example.js. I hear it's the best, most amazing thing ever. It's going to solve all my problems and it's got an amazing logo. I cannot wait to try it. All right, let me see. Okay, so there's a commercial version and an open source version. Oh, I'll try both, but let's start with the commercial version first. I've got a whole lot of time on my hands and I just want to, you know, kick the tires, have an experiment, just, just get it working as quickly as possible. Okay, let me see. Huh, looks like I need to fill in a form before I can download it. <sighs> Fine, all right. They want my name, okay, my email address, my phone number, and where I live. I don't know why they need to know that, but sure. Okay, submitted. Okay, submitted. Now, oh, hang on a minute. I'm just getting a phone call. Uh, hello? You're from the example.js sales team. Okay. Hey, what do I think? Am I thinking about grading? I don't know. I mean, I just filled the form in. I haven't even downloaded it yet. Can you maybe like give me a little bit longer? Can you call back tomorrow? Are you sure. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 That was a bit keen. All right. Fine. Okay. Now let me see. Maybe I can finally try the software. Okay. Now, hang on. I just got an email. What's that? Oh, it's from the support team saying if I have any questions, I can let them know. They're really keen to hear my feedback. All right. Fine. I mean, it was only a couple of minutes ago, but sure. Okay, let me just delete that for now. All right. Now, can I try the software? Let me see. Oh, hang on. I just got another email. Okay. It's from the product team this time. Really keen to hear my feedback. If there's any features I think I'm missing, any blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah, I mean, again, just, like, just give me a minute just to start this. Okay, all right, fine, fine. 
delete that. Okay, now I'm on the dashboard for the software. Finally, oh, hang on, there's a whole bunch of notifications I just need to dismiss. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Ah, I could finally try the software. Okay, so now I'm just looking at the open source version. Okay, it uses Node to run it. That's fine. That's that's pretty normal. Let me just run the installation command. Oh, okay. It needs a different version of Node from the version I have installed. I have the latest version installed. I mean, that's oh, that would be fine, but okay, but obviously not. So I've got to install a different version. Uh, let me just remind myself how to do that. Yeah. Okay, install it. Wait. Right, okay, let's try again. All right, good. Okay, now install the dependencies it needs. All right, okay. Oh. Need to compile native code, which means they need to have a C compiler installed. Fine, it's not that unusual. Fine, uh, just check I've got one. Okay, I just need to update that. Make sure everything's configured correctly. Okay, cool. All right, let's try installing it again now. Oh, okay. I need a Python module for a JavaScript project. Fine, let's install that too. Okay, all right. I think I can finally install the dependencies. Ah, and it's installed. Okay, so now I'm just having a look at the Getting Started guide. Great job, by the way. Yeah, there's a few things that have changed. I mean, the inter some things on the interface have moved around a bit. There seem to be some new features. A couple of the, 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 the screenshots are showing something different from what I'm seeing. I guess someone released a new version and um, the guide hasn't been updated yet. I mean, okay, I, I looked around, I asked a few questions, I looked in to a, in the open source version, I looked in a, in a few bits of code and, and figured it out and I changed a few examples and yeah, I got there in the end. I mean, it took a bit of time. I could have been something else, but I got there in the end. So follow the guide, works great. So how can documentarians help with the getting started and onboarding experience for a developer-focused project. Documentarians can help by advocating from a new user's perspective repeatedly. We are often the first people to try new features and changes after the developer who created them has created them. So we can test regularly from this new user's perspective and we can cast aside all assumptions that a developer may make about that end user. For this, we can use things like containers and virtual machines that help us have a fresh vanilla test machine each time. There's lots of getting started guides and, and help out there if you're not familiar with these tools. I'm also happy to help answer any questions on how you can use them too. These mean that we can start afresh every time as a new user would and make sure that what we are telling them to do works for everybody. We can also help contribute to things like automated testing. This is automated testing of the code, but also of our documentation. But maybe that is a separate conversation. But again, one I'm happy to talk at length about. Because sometimes developers have a tendency to create tests for their code that matches the code not an end use case, and we can advocate for tests that help with that. You can also create things like boilerplate examples. These are example code bases with various language setups, various infrastructure setups that a new end user can download and experiment with whilst they read alongside your documentation. We can also ensure, again, maybe through automated means or just through practice within the company, that application changes do not happen without documentation changes. Okay, so now I followed the getting started guide, but I mean, I need to do something, you know, real world with this, something that actually suits my use case. Uh, so now what do I do? Um, I can see there's some sections here about particular features, functions, API calls, but I mean, I have a particular use case that is relevant to me and, and my project that, 
is somewhat specific. So how do I figure out how to take those examples and apply it to my use case? Hmm, I'm gonna click around some pages. I'm not really sure what I'm looking for. Let me maybe just do a quick search. See if anyone's written any blog posts or find any other examples anywhere of someone who's done the same thing or, or something similar. So yeah, I spend a bit of time, I read a few things, I try a few things, I look in some forums. Um, if I'm following the commercial path, I, I ask some, some questions to the chat and eventually I figured it out. I've figured out a few things, I've assembled the pieces together, and I've spent a whole bunch of time, but I'm getting there and I'm learning. So how can documentarians help with the ongoing learning experience of an end user for a developer-focused tool? Well, a lot of documentation produced by developers, and maybe you are a new hire in a, in a company where the, the documentation has mostly been written by developers so far, or maybe you're editing their content, or maybe you're creating things from afresh, in which case some of this advice may not apply to you. But a lot of documentation produced by developers is focused in terms of the code base or the functionality and features of sections of the code base, not necessarily the actual use cases. This can lead either to documentation that does not really help the end user assemble the tool into their use case, but it can also lead to overly complicated tools that end users will find hard to know how to apply to solve their problems. Documentarians can help in a couple of different ways. Firstly, if there is no one else available, we can speak to users and customers or gather that information from other teams if there are people available to find out some of the actual use cases and setup steps, not the assumed ones. We can also look in places like repository issues, stack overflow posts, and general blog posts and forums to find some of this information too. We can also make documentation part of the onboarding process and the continued learning process, integrating it directly with a tool. And by doing this, we can have the steps that we know people need to follow or will help them understand enough to get started and then start to fill in the rest of the gaps themselves. We can help with this information in hand, create guides that follow these common use cases and identify the common difficulties and misunderstandings that people experience. More crucially though, we can feed back a lot of this information to the development teams and encourage them to perhaps build the software in a different way. This means that not only is our documentation better, but the actual product is better. And this, by knock-on effect, means that the documentation will hopefully be better too. In all honesty, sometimes we can only do so much with our documentation if the actual tool itself is not very user-friendly. Okay, great. I've spent some time learning example.js. Uh, I've learned the basics. I've even got a little bit of a, a proof of concept working now. I mean, have a look at this. Look, wow, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, and, um, but I have some deeper questions. I have some concerns and some issues I've found. And, you know, for the open source version, I could even fix them. So I contacted support. I posted an issue in the project repository, but I didn't hear anything. Um, I got... Actually, someone was kind of rude to me. They weren't very helpful. They're a bit unclear or they said something that didn't really make sense to me as someone who's just starting out. Uh, it didn't really address my problem. It just kind of went on down about something else. Um, so yeah, that, didn't, that was a little bit off-putting. Um, then I was looking on the, on the roadmap and I saw some blog posts about some features I was really interested in, but then it was never really never really delivered. I mean, the blog post was written a few months ago and the, the feature never really came out. Um, and then I read something in a marketing copy that 
made this feature sound really impressive or useful, but it wasn't really. It didn't really work that well. It was a bit unstable. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Example JS, it's okay. Documentarians can create the best documentation we can, but if bugs go unfixed, promises are broken, roadmap features slip, the developers and end users do not feel listened to, and ultimately will leave and find something else. Documentarians can help by working with other team members to help create clear and useful and meaningful communications that set realistic expectations. We can create style guides to help all team members have a consistent voice and way of communicating. We can use clear language to explain things the way they really are, as opposed to language that says nothing. We can help create contributor and developer guides so people know how to contribute to a project and understand the steps to do so and the steps to have their contributions accepted and discussed. In short, we have a tendency to focus and think about clear and concise language. And if we can spread those same thoughts around other team members, we can all communicate in a much clearer and more concise way with our end users too. So great. Let's have a look at a few examples of some projects that do aspects of some of the bits of advice I've covered so far well. I drew from a few of the examples I have so far done in the stream. And I also asked uh, out on social media for a few examples that people particularly liked. And not all of these will do everything perfectly. There are still some pitfalls, but I'm going to try and point out the positives as much as possible. First, I will look at Rust, an increasingly popular programming language that is famous for a couple of things and aspects to its developer experience. Number one, is its book. This is its main documentation that is available in a multitude of formats, including as part of the installation of Rust itself, which is quite cool. There is also sections for going into more detail in individual parts of Rust, if you know kind of more what you're looking for. And also available are very thorough Error messages, Rust is infamous for its quite helpful error messages, which is a fundamental part of developer experience. And finally, there are sections for common application domains of Rust and sections for people who want to go really deep into particular details. As you can see from the whole book itself, there's quite a lot of content there, as you'd expect. It is a programming language after all. And the Getting Started Guide is a fairly familiar Hello World example. Uh, it's hard for me to say without going into much more detail how it then continues from there. But I know a lot of people are fans of Rust, so I am guessing that the next steps are reasonably good. Looking into other areas we covered, the Rust website also has lots of sections here for governance, showing you very clearly where you can find requests for comments and roadmaps the various teams involved, including, very nice to see, a documentation team. <laughs> and also working groups covering more uh, community side aspects like moderation and particular technical aspects as well. There is also an entire community section outside of governance that shows you some of the ways that you can engage with the community and talk and share problems and also meetups and previous events and videos and things like that, and kind of what they call their community itself. And it's also a code of conduct and right down the bottom, a contributor's guide called the Ruby Forge, which is kind of cool. Another example mentioned to me was Laravel, a web framework that's reasonably well-known and well-established. Uh, you can see we have right at the top here documentation and the quite well-known LaraCast, which is a whole video series that's been running for a very long time, actually. Uh, it also shows you how you can get started with uh, hosting platforms quite quickly. And then a whole section of the various parts of the ecosystem that you might find useful as starting points or particular features you're looking to find out more about. Laravel is also quite famous for having this homestead, a, a virtual machine, a machine you can install on your machine that gets you started with everything you need 
very quickly so you don't have to go and install a bunch of dependencies. And um, as you can see here, it uses a tool called Vagrant, where it takes a little bit of time, I did, did find, <laughs> uh, and gives you some nice instructions to step through to pick how you might want to set up that virtual machine. And then you wait a fair bit of time for it to download, and you can get it up and running and start experimenting with Laravel without having to download lots of bits and pieces. It's all in one convenient package instead. Another good example people pointed out to me that sounds a little bit like my made-up example is Next.js, a framework for building applications with JavaScript. Uh, and there's a few aspects here I'd like to, to show you. So firstly, again, it has good clear links to where to get started, and it has documentation and a learning experience with steps that are very clearly laid out here and even kind of a bit of gamification on um, how to encourage people to keep learning. So looking at that tutorial itself, there's a couple of nice aspects here that it keeps mentioning and reiterating. It tells you exactly what to expect and to look for a finished example to know if you have it wrong or right, and the source that you can just look at if you are so inclined as well. As you go through each step, you get points. It's very clearly showing you where you are in the structure as well. It clearly points out what dependencies you will need, which is very nice. It tells you how to find more help if you get stuck. And it has commands that are replicated in the example application that you create. So pretty much the first few steps in each case, as you can see in this screenshot, are identical in your terminal and on the documentation page. And again, it reiterates at each step, here's how to get help, which I think is really nice. And has um, things you can do for kind of extra bonus points if you've already done the, the other content. I should mention a couple of the commercial examples. This first one is Sourcegraph, which actually was one of the first live streams I did. And the team actually responded to my feedback and found it very useful, which was super cool for me. Um, so in the first case here, we have used Docker, another kind of virtual machine running on your machine to start an instance of the Sourcegraph application. It gives us a very nice screen there and a link to jump to. And we have to create an account. This is all running locally on my machine, so I have no fear of showing you passwords here. And once you get to the dashboard, you'll see right at the top and in the middle, uh, in kind of formatted in different ways, are the steps you need to do to get Sourcegraph to work. Now, granted, the connections between them could be a little easier. Maybe the links in the middle could also be links that take you to something, and not just disclosure links, but they do get checked once you've finished each step. And then as you go to each step, there's more instructions and more ways to fill in the information that is needed. Again, it's not always completely clear and there's a little bit of trial and error, but you generally know when you have done the right thing and when that step is completed, which is quite nice. And then one more, actually a local company here in Berlin called Rasa, Rasa, I'm never quite sure. Actually, their installation steps are a little bit convoluted and confusing. Uh, there's a lot of Python involved. Someone alludes back to some of my statements earlier. But once you do have it installed, it does have these really nice starter packs. And there's actually a couple of others I found in my live stream that seem to have removed their starter packs, strangely. Maybe they also do take time to maintain. This is one thing to consider. But as this is a machine learning a tool, having predefined data is kind of fundamentally important, otherwise you can't really do much. So it provides you with these starter packs to have information and data and models you can play with, which is quite nice. And that brings us to the end of this presentation on how documentarians are a crucial, key, central part of the overall developer experience of any developer-focused tool or project. I hope you found it interesting. I am happy to take any questions here um, or elsewhere. Uh, you can see my contact details on the screen. I'm very much happy to talk about these subjects in great detail. But do not let anybody say to you in your role, or whether that be in the, the employer that pays you or on an open source project, you're just 
a writer. You just write documentation. We are in a crucial position within many projects to see how all the moving pieces in a, in a tool, in a project connect together and sit between uh, marketing and product and engineering and end users to really be able to advocate for those end users well. So embrace that position and do not be afraid to help improve that overall experience. Thank you very much. All right, Chris, thanks for joining us for Q&A after your um, pretty awesome presentation about uh, DX. There are so many different ways of saying that, isn't it? Like, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely a, a a growing industry, which is good to see because you know the 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 whole that other side of um the experience sphere is a really good one to nail because more and more things are becoming more developer centric now. Aren't they it really is a growing trend. Mm. Yeah, so um. We, we have had some questions coming through, so I might jump in. And folks, if you can think of any more questions as we're talking, don't hesitate to drop them into the chat and uh, we can get to them as well if we have time. So uh, the first question is, um, um, what's your experience working with um, developers' feedback? For example, you know, is the number of received feedback items you know, high or do you communicate your corresponding actions to the feedback with uh, the developers? So yeah, this I think depends a little bit on the on the company. Um, interestingly, with the stream, I have actually shared the video with a few people, and the more engaged teams, that usually the ones that are a bit bigger and have uh, someone like a developer relations, developer evangelist, like someone who sits in a bit more in between as a defined role, mm. they often join the sessions as well and note down things. So I've helped actually fix a few typos, a few that last example in the in the, the the video from source graph that was actually the first one i did and they actually fixed a whole bunch of things after the video which was kind of cool right. as well so those those have um have done it in terms of inside companies um i find personally it takes a little bit of time mm. for for me to give that feedback because i want to be sure as well if i just dive in and do a do a do something as a as a as a as an end user, I'm kind of feel more like, well, I'm your customer. Here's my feedback. Deal with it. Mm. But if I'm actually working in a company, I feel like I want to understand things a little more, and um, also know if uh, there's reasons behind some of those things. Um, and not, you know, when when you're just throwing something over the fence and leaving it, you've got no real worries about offending people. But if you're actually in a company, you kind of want to make sure that um, that you're not offending your workmates as well. So there's a little, a little bit of learning the ropes before you go and give a lot of feedback and maybe understanding some of the details yourself first. But then when you are ready to do that, I think it's the same thing. Do it from a uh, perspective of an end user, not just, I was looking at this and I didn't like it, et cetera, et cetera. But I looked at this and I think this would be useful to change because X, Y, Z, and even better if you can make suggestions with it, it just with text or actually like depending on the product make a pull request or something like that actually i think um i think it's always better to offer alternatives not just hey this 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 doesn't this isn't good fix it <laughs> so mm. it's taking a little bit of time with um and even with the current company we've started doing that uh, i think um going through the getting started experience made the development team actually fix a few things um that reduced a few steps that people had to follow and stuff like that. So it can take a little bit of time, but right. it will happen with the right team. Okay. Yeah, right. So essentially do the do a little bit of legwork first so you can have an intelligent conversation with the people yep. you want to actually do the work with. Yeah, that's definitely exactly. good advice. Do you um do you see a trend where um DX sort of gets involved in in the the whole idea of requirements traceability, you know, like tracing from requirements to code to tests to something else there as well do you see that sort of thing being needed as part of dx maybe i think at this point it's a little more it, this is where i think at this point is where ux and dx cross over um and in in some cases they're the same and in some cases they're not it really depends on the on the product hmm. um but dx generally seems to be mostly at the moment a little more um after after case like we've we've done we've released this thing, 
let's see what people think, let's have conference talks, let's have hackathons, let's have meetups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that tends to be a little bit more from there. Uh, I am sure there are companies who are um, doing much more of the, the upfront experience gathering. But I think that probably comes more broadly just from market fit, business research, things like that. Um, and then it's more about getting a developer to kick the tires and, and see if they can understand it and um, then all the stuff up front. I think, I think that's probably more the crossover. I say this is still a, a somewhat vague and in, in, in theory, the answer to your question is yes and no, but I think, the, I think those requirements pre-development are more handled by other teams at the moment but it is kind of all the same thing. <laughs> but it's just different words. Um, and then I guess, it, it, yeah, I think I think it feeds into yeah, feedback, uh, promoter scores, all this kind of stuff too. Um, but I haven't I haven't heard anyone explicitly saying that. But I think they're probably doing it. I don't know if that answers the question or not. I did see that question come up, and I didn't have a good answer. It's really interesting <laughs> at this moment in time. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it is a it's a it's an interesting question. I think it it almost centers around from from my perspective. It seems like developer experience. I think might have the the whole idea that it's sort of more towards the the tail end of the product development life cycle, perhaps. And I think this this yeah. this idea might be you know getting them further towards the front side of the planning and the engagement side of you know creating a product i think so mm. i think so it's, it's slightly difficult though because often with um more uh, less developer focused tools you can kind of make mock-ups and clickable um prototypes and things like that with a developer tool it's mm. kind of hard to do that i was actually asked to test something like that and it was the same thing a lot of the feedback they got from me was like, well, I can't do anything. I can't really give you any feedback. <laughs> I'm just clicking around a website. It's sort of, yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard to make a prototype without having done quite a bit of work. <laughs> yeah. Developer focus things. You're probably right. So, there. It is a bit of a different it's a piece, challenge. But, yeah. Yeah. You're right. But maybe things like, like this kind of growing way of no code tools and things like that will, will, will help with that in the long run. It's hard to say. You, you never know. It may actually start to bridge the gap a bit there as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how how the whole arena evolves um, over time. Um, I think you know the the more developers see that you know having a good experience in the app up front and you know not not front loading everything like you know your, mm -hmm. like your brother showed us in the video. Those <laughs> just an avalanche of stuff coming at you. When you first try yep. a product, it's these little sort of touch points in the whole process that make a big difference. And sometimes it's just and that it's definitely like, comes from company discussion. I get the feeling yeah. that's often from other departments and yes. uh, and teammates, and that is something where it's like, no, people don't actually like this stuff. I know you want your sales score up, but people don't like this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's too much, too soon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's one other question which, which doesn't necessarily relate to the content, but it did relate to the art that was behind behind yeah. you when you were doing the um the recording. What were the art pieces behind you all there? Um, so the Mac picture is actually you can't really see in the uh, in the video, but up front it's actually like um an old classic Mac with all these little people inside, like oh. running the Mac. <laughs> and it's from a, a company called Dorothy. We are Dorothy.com. It's an English company. I'm sure they were shipped to Australia. Mm. Um, that one's easier to get. The other one um, is actually from a local artist here. So I don't know if you can get a copy called uh, Katerina Voronina. Um, hang on. So she's a Russian Israeli artist here in Berlin. And I saw her art in a cafe when I was feeling particularly downbeat about everything happening in 2020. And I saw this artwork and it, the whole artwork was about, it had a piece underneath about not getting lost in your own feelings when you're feeling down. I was like, that's so appropriate right now, I'm buying it. <laughs> Needs to want, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, that one might be harder for people to get hold of, unfortunately, but. Uh... Well, that has been a very interesting um, uh, Q and A. Um, Thanks heaps for, for joining us uh, today, Chris. And um, where can people find out more information if they've got some more questions about uh, DX? Um, you can always find me on, at chrischiller.com, at Chris Jinch on Twitter, 
Slack. I always forget my username on Slack because I have so many. Chris Ward, my boring normal name on, on the Write the Doc Slack if you want to ask me questions too. Um, and Chris at ChrisDigilla.com is probably a good email. There you go. All the things. So get on it if you've got any questions for Chris. Thanks again for joining us, Chris. And, right. um, Thanks, Jared.